Thanks for being. Um, my name is Courtney Campbell, and I'm the head of Professor of Religion and Culture in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. And uh, we're organizing several initiatives within the new school to advance this academic study of religion and the role that you can help us uh, uh, advance those. And we're delighted to have our speaker, um, Lori Pearson, who is a professor, a co professor in the history of Christian theology at Carleton College, which is a very, uh, very strong, very reputable liberal arts college in, in Minnesota, um, one of the best in the nation. Um, uh, Professor Pearson has interest in the modern philosophy of religion, in social theory, race, and feminist thought. Um, and her research has focused primarily on concepts of religion, modernity, and the secular in, in 19th century Germany. Um, she's the author of Beyond Essence, Ernst Trelch as historian and theorist of Christianity, and co-editor uh, in 2004 of the Future of the Study of Religion. Um, and currently, and the reason that uh, I was most interested to have a sort of person with us um, is uh, she's working on uh, uh, Marianne Faber, uh, the spouse of Max Faber, who I came into the religious studies on through Max Faber. I uh, didn't know the influence of Marianne Faber, so uh, Professor Pearson uh, is exploring the ways that um, Marianne Faber's cultural and political uh, debates about women's rights um, at the turn of the century in Germany, uh, 20th century theories of religion, and social order. Thank you so much for coming out. It's really, really fun to be here. I very much enjoyed your beautiful campus and your beautiful weather that you have for me for these two weeks, I understand. And it's been great to see your collegiality and to hear a talk today and to see the kind of intellectual vitality. So I've had a blast. It's been really fun. So thanks for having me. And I wanted to um, thank um, Bob and Helani for your help. And then also, of course, um, Courtney and Amy for everything you've done for my visit. I know that you've been at dinner. I have David, Stewart, Chris. It's been really wonderful to be hosted by such lovely colleagues. So, um, the title of my talk is Sexuality and Secularization, so I wanted to do kind of a pre-introduction to talk a little bit about why I'm starting with the notion of secularization and how I want to frame my talk with respect to current debates over the secular in the field today. Um, so over the past decade, as many of you know, um, debates concerning what the words religion, modernity, and secularization mean have animated the field of religious studies, especially in areas related to theories and methods for the study of religion. Indeed, countless scholars have produced new intellectual histories and cultural anthropological genealogies of the concept of the secular, especially as it emerged in the work of the founders of the modern discipline of religion. And it's become commonplace to show in this scholarship how terms like modernity, secularization, and religion were co-constituted and informed by certain contingent historical changes, normative concerns, or political projects in 19th century Europe. And um, as a sort of to put it out there in the simplest terms, what came to be called much later by the mid-20th century, the secularization thesis was the claim that as societies modernize and institutions are organized and controlled by rational and calculable bureaucratic principles and perhaps marked by increasing individualism, religion finds its place in the private sphere, in the realm of feeling and individual belief, and ultimately declines. And this thesis, as you know, has been all but debunked now, and my purpose is actually not to dwell on the thesis. Um, itself, um, because the scholarly interest has shifted from an attack on this thesis um, to an analysis of the values that helped produce it and the cultural context in which it emerged. And categories then, like the modern, the, the religion, and the secular came to be defined at a particular moment in Protestant uh, in European intellectual context. And so, as Tomoka, Tomoka Masuzawa in The Invention of World Religions puts it, uh, the category, the generic category religion, as used today, arose at a particular time in Europe when it seemed to be declining among educated, self-consciously modern elites, and began to take on. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, began to take on a particular limited shape and function. 
Here, there emerges a definition of so-called religion that reflects a modern liberal Protestant model and that is shaped by efforts to define and understand the modern world, or what modernity itself means. So this definition as generic starts to be associated with religion as individual belief and linked to processes of modernization, um, and presented as generic but having a Protestant province. And then conversely, religion, therefore, also looked differently among those who were unlike these Europeans, whether so-called primitive or pre-modern or Eastern Oriental, etc. Um, so the dis this discourse is, is being interrogated. Um, and so scholars like Masuzawa and Talal Assad have, and many others have produced these important analyses of the co-constitution of these categories. Uh, and mostly by drawing on tools, intellectual tools, related to the study of colonialism, Western cultural imperialism, and empire. And so I would like to suggest that gender concerns were also influential for the development of intellectual categories that were formed at this time, in my case, around 1900 in Germany. This time that was so central for the shaping of the modern disciplines of religion and sociology. Um, indeed, I argue, looking at the specific cultural and political debates about marriage, the family, and sexuality in Germany around the turn of the century helps us complicate, and in some cases correct, how we tell the story about the origins of our discipline and how we understand the meaning of the intellectual categories that shape our interpretation of religion up to the present day. So I carry, about, carry out my analysis by looking at a forgotten female theorist of religion, Mariana Weber, a figure who remains largely unknown in the study of religion and whose work has all but fallen into obscurity, especially in the American context. Today remembered as what wife of Max Weber, uh, Mariana Weber was quite well known in her own time as an influential public intellectual and the leader of the moderate wing of the women's movement in Germany in the early 1900s. So before I tell you more about her life and work, let me begin first with an anecdote, and then a sketch of the cultural context in which the Weber's lived, and I argue in which fundamental theories and methods for the study of religion were crafted in modern form. Um, so during the years around 1900 in Heidelberg, Max and Mariana Weber participated in a salon and later hosted one of their own that included rising stars and established scholars who were involved in shaping the contours of their academic disciplines and debating the significance of modernity for long-standing intellectual categories and institutions in the realms of politics, religion, culture, history, economics, and society. So scholars of classical philology, New Testament, Israelite religion, political economics, religion, philosophy, constitu constitutional law, and the emerging discipline of sociology reflected together on political modernization, the rapid growth of modern capitalism, the rationalization of Western culture, and questions of social reform. So these circles, and this is a picture of um, the house where the Heidelberg lived, and actually, um, where the salon eventually would take place, and it's also the place where um, the Trouch family lived upstairs, the person in my first book on, um, together overlooking the bank on So these circles um, were a new kind of academic interaction and exchange among intellectuals. Private gatherings where men, and eventually women, shared intellectual and artistic interests outside the status hierarchy of the old professoriate. The scholars in this circle took particular interest um, in the role of religion as a source of ethical orientation in the face of a perceived crisis of modernity. So it was for this circle, called the Eranos Christ, which is a friendship circle. I just did this when I thought these little covers were really kind of hilarious. But anyway, <laughs> it was for this circle that um, Max Weber first wrote and delivered in 1904 his essays that would become The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. So, in this work, as is well known, um, Max Weber argued that the Puritans and other early modern Anglo-American Protestant groups, all of which he gave the term uh, or the name ascetic Protestantism or Protestant asceticism, had a special relationship to the growth and success of capitalism, especially in America. Protestant asceticism, in a nutshell, provided the spiritual backbone for capitalism and enabled it to flourish. The key was that asceticism, in Protestant asceticism, is this worldly and not otherworldly, and it refers to the rationalization of conduct in this world, and the need for proof of one's holiness in this world, but for the sake of salvation. So there's an urge to work hard in this world and yet not partake of the, of the rewards of this world as evidence of one's holiness. 
So in the days leading up to Max's presentation, where he first gave this book in, in the form of essays in this intellectual circle, um, Mariana wrote in a letter to her mother-in-law. This is a quotable quote. Tomorrow, the scholarly discussion group with 10 gentlemen is in store for us. Max is taking care of Protestant asceticism. I am in charge of him and Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> As Mariana's comments indicates, women were excluded from the salon as indeed they were from much of university life at the time. They were, however, in no way wholly absent, and certainly not without influence. Mariana was, of course, physically present, though presumably overseeing the kitchen staff, as hostess, um, but was involved as, as a supporter of Max's career and promoter of his ideas, and as a well-known scholar in her own right who engaged in intellectual exchange with some of the leading members of this and other scholarly circles. Um, so people outside this circle, for example, she would have been, she had correspondence with Georg Simmel, the sociologist from Berlin, and uh, Emil um, Durkheim reviewed some of her scholarly work. She was invited um, by a number of leading Protestant theologians of the day, including Adolf Harnick and Eric Trouch, to give various talks. Um, so she was very much in dialogue with all sorts of scholars at, at the part of this uh, intellectual circle. So during this time, uh, Mariana Weber's research on religious and legal norms concerning women and the family made an important contribution to these discussions of this intellectual circle. She not only drew upon and helped shape abstract categories about domination, authority, and the nature of religion itself, but also used her research to call for the reform of Germany's marriage laws and to weigh in on cultural questions about sexual morality and the rights of women and children. So indeed, the question of women's emancipation was in the air and was therefore among the features of modern culture that these scholars grappled with, along with other themes related to social reform and labor. Finally, woman, as an abstract category, and other related categories, family, eroticism, marriage, were present as conceptual tools in the analyses of the ethos of modern culture, which was often perceived by these male scholars as, an, as undergoing a crisis or engulfed in some tragic situation, um, shaped by the alienating influence of bureaucracy or rationalization on human interactions and the loss of sort of genuine subjectivity, which is often portrayed as female, versus objectivity or objective community, <clears throat> which is read as male. So these academic circles then were located in a cultural context marked by experimentation, cultural innovation, ideological classes, clashes, and new calls for the emancipation, uh, uh, new calls for emancipation, such as that made by the women's movement. Um, new ideas also about sexuality, aesthetics, and culture clashed with definitions of so-called old institutions and values. Um, an experimental cu countercultural elite or avant-garde in Heidelberg and other cities at the time called for a new ethic of sexual liberation and erotic experimentation beyond the confines of the institution of marriage. And they became a controversial topic of discussion in Weber's and others in other intellectual circles. So at this time also with the adoption of uh, the civil code and the private system of private law in Germany in 1900, um, women were recognized as legal persons, um, no longer needed consent to work and had legal ownership over their earnings. But otherwise, however, this new civil code um, preserved the husband's and the father's authority over his wife and children and made divorce much more difficult for women to initiate. And in the face of this new code, which was largely opposed by the women's movement, um, scholars and political organizations grappled with controversial questions about changing roles in institutions, including those having to do with women's emancipation, sexuality, abortion and marriage law. So more broadly, um, the years around 1900 also saw the creation of large women's coalition, coalitions in Germany. And um, this is a gathering in 1904 in Berlin, the International Women's Conference, they'll talk about for a second later, in fact, which Marianne Weber spoke, and also um, Charlotte Curtis Gilman, and various other women from around the world. Um, so in 1908, um, legislation was passed that uh, officially allowed women to congregate and participate in political meetings. And during these years, Marianne Weber and other leaders of the women's movement in Heidelberg, especially the spouses of the people in Max Weber's intellectual circle, organized lectures and started a women's legal council that addressed issues such as abortion. Despite this history, though, um, analyses of the origin of theories of religion and modernity largely ignored the debates over women's rights and definitions of gender, sexuality, and the family that were central to the period during which the modern discipline of religion was created. A consideration of Marianne Weber's works helps us see this gender dimension of our field and its categories. 
So before turning to these themes that I want to focus on in her actual writings, um, I would like to um, tell you a little bit more about her life, and especially with regard to her intellectual contributions and her political work in the women's movement. So in her own time, Marianne Weber was regarded as more well-known than Max Weber, and there's a little anecdote about someone on the street who says, well, who is, Max, who is that Max Weber anyway? And the other person says, oh, well, he's Marianne's guy. Um, and so, uh, so she was author of um, the author of nine new books and was a popular public speaker. Um, she was also active in cultural and political organizations. Um, in 1897, she started a branch of an ed or, uh, educational organization for women. Um, in 1902, she set up a legal aid office for socially disprivileged mothers and girls. Um, and as, as I mentioned, in 1904, um, she traveled to America with Max. Weber, her husband, and with Ernst Trouch, um, to meet with a range of intellectuals and to attend the World's Fair in St. Louis. And there she visited um, settlement houses and other organizations working for the social welfare of women and girls in various cities, including um, Hull House in Chicago, where she met Jane Adams as well. And this is just an example of a typical kind of um, organization or place she would have visited when she was there in New York. So back in Germany, as I mentioned, in 1904, she spoke at the International Women's Conference in Berlin, um, along with lots of other intellectuals, including Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And there she gave two important essays, um, one, Marriage and the Vocation, and another, The Contribution of Women to the Social Sciences. Um, at this time, also, she was a popular speaker among kind of Protestant, liberal Protestant ministers, groups of kind of educated ministers, um, at the invitation of Adolf Tarnak, an important um, scholar of Protestant theology and New Testament in 1907. She was the first woman to deliver a lecture to the Protestant Social Congress, and she spoke, gave a talk called Principles of Sexual Ethics. So, um, she also became involved in official politics, and in 1919 she was elected to the State Assembly in Baden as a member of the German Democratic Party. Um, it, it was in 1920 that she became uh, president of the large women's organization in um, Germany. And um, after Max's death in 1920, she um, established her own intellectual circle, which is the picture. Um, and include, which this included actually large numbers of women participants, um, uh, who actually though few gave presentations, but there were a very large number of people who participated. Um, and so, as I mentioned, over the course of her life, uh, she wrote and spoke regularly and also edited many of Max's works that were published after his death and published countless essays of her own also in popular women's journals. So, um, in, 19, in 1900, um, the, the year that the new civil code was adopted in Germany, Marianne Weber began writing her major work and her most famous work um, called Wife and Mother in the Development of Legal Norms, which was published in 19. And it's this book that's going to be the focus of my remarks tonight. So in this massive work of historical sociology, uh, Mariana Weber explores the gender ethic of, the civiliz of civilizations and religions that she sees as contributing to the ethos of modern Germany with an eye to the future of women's emancipation. So specifically, Weber describes and analyzes customs, laws, and norms concerning marriage, sexuality, prostitution, male authority, female submission and autonomy, and the status of children in what she calls ancient cultures and religions, including so-called primitive religions, Egyptian and Babylonian cultures, um, the early periods of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, as well as Hellenistic culture and Greek religions, and the, tr the traditions of medieval Europe, the Reformation, and modern, uh, mostly Anglo-American Protestantism and then contemporary German culture. And the book ends then with an explicit treatment and critique of the new civil rights. So in my current research, I'm teasing out a theory of religion that I argue is at work in this major 1907 book. And specifically, I'm interested in how Weber creates a typology of religions that is deeply shaped by questions about appropriate sexuality and the proper path to the emancipation of women in regard to their relationship with men. So for this, uh, this second half of my remarks now tonight, I'd like to look at three parts of this theory. So first, um, her analysis of so-called primitive religions and uh, the relevance of this analysis for thinking about sexuality and domination. And this, uh, this notion of primitive religion then becomes a foundation point for her kind of typology of different religions uh, that, she, that she become the object of kind of comparative study. So second, her assessment of monotheism 
and its effect on the status of women. And finally, her vision of marriage and, moder and modernization, which becomes evident as she traces conceptions of gender authority, power, protection, and emancipation into the early modern period. So here, then, she takes actually um, special interest in the marriage ideals of Puritans, um, and begins then, in some sense, to sketch uh, a, a story of modernization somewhat parallel and akin to what was sketched out in the Protestant ethic of the spirit of capitalism, but this time with respect to uh, marriage and the family, and therefore, perhaps, depending on how we define the secular, kind of a precursor to some kind of theory or her own unique introduction into theories of secularization. So I don't have any more slides at this point, I'm outlining theories. Um, so looking at these and other elements of Marianne Weber's work, I suggest, helps us see that questions of gender inform the construction and the application of theoretical tools and distinctions that would shape the study of religion into the next century. Um, her work also helps us revise scholarly understandings of fundamental categories like religion, agency, tradition, and modernity. And our assumptions about how these categories developed, what they should mean today, shift if we think of them in relationship to these kinds of issues. So my first section then has to do with Marianne Weber on sexuality and so-called primitive religion. So chapter one of Weber's 1907 book is called Primitive Gender Relations and Legitimate Marriage. So in this chapter, she takes up competing anthropological accounts of the origins of male-female relations, including theories of group marriage, kinship structures, mother rights, and matriarchy. Um, one of her goals in this chapter is to refute the general idea, picked up and elaborated by Friedrich Engels and embraced by many socialist and feminist intellectuals, um, of an original state of gender relations that was free of male domination, or the flip side, that was predicated on women's authority or autonomy. The pattern in these other analyses that she's critical of was that private property, monogamy, and sexual regulation were the root of women's subordination and patriarchal oppression. So Marianne Weber develops her theory of gender relations in opposition to Engels' claim, and does not see these allegedly, in her view, female-centered primitive practices of sexuality as progressive calls for women's emancipation. So notwithstanding the uh, many variations in kinship practices among the groups that they were lumped into the category of primitive religions. Um, these cultures, in her view, share a model of sexuality and of male-female relations that she classifies, we might say, as unregulated, according to rationalized or ethical norms. So in other words, violence or force, violence and force, or the threat of, of both, or the demands of survival, determine the male-female relation. Um, the power and right of the stronger results in situations in which women are property and completely subject to the, to the whims of men. The kinship patterns that do exist are often created due to necessity or expediency and do not have the quality of rationalized or even spiritualized purpose that she attributes to the more official or legitimate institutions of other periods or cultures. So Weber names uh, the type of authority, and I, and I suggest also the type of sexuality, found in these groups, primitive patriarchalism. Um, and so this is not yet an actual or so-called legitimate, in the technical sense of the term, form of domination because it doesn't produce obedience through commands or duties, which we'll talk about a little bit about later. So the main, main legal structure of primitive patriarchalism is the full gender enslavement of women, she says. Um, woman is the possession of men, whether husbands, fathers, brothers, or whoever, who can sell, rent, pawn, prostitute her, and merge her with their estate. She has no possessions and no spirit of rights. The father has unlimited force over all, and there are no notions of legitimate children or legitimate marriage in our sense. In all these cultures and tribes, she says, quote, we can only speak of marriage in a figurative sense. These forms of various forms of kinship are relations of force and reflect the unconditioned triumph of male domination. So as she describes the gender, the development of gender relations in various uh, contexts. Weber draws on nascent uh, intellectual categories and social theory to define and distinguish types of power, authority, and organization, and to explore their implications for the status of women. So she suggests that power, in its most basic or primitive form, is based on physical domination or force, the Germans evolved, of the strong over the weak. And prior to political organizations, one would speak of power only as force. Um, the power that is at the foundations of politics, she calls something else, mocked and is rooted in violence or the threat of violence. Uh, this power takes the form of domination, another form of authority, when it demands or produces obedience through commands. 
So she's drawing on all these terms that were being developed by sociologists at the time and applying them to her kind of analysis of the history of, of so-called primitive um, sexual relations. So dominant, domination, then, in her view, becomes legitimate um, when obedience to commands take on moral significance as a duty or something one ought to do. Um, so primitive patriarchy then lacks legitimacy uh, because it is undeveloped and unsystematized and based on contingencies of arbitrary force and not on principles or reasons. Um, so uh, just as a reminder that Max Weber um, in Politics of Vocation and various other writings um, distinguished among three types of what was called legitimate domination or domination based on reasons for one's obedience. Um, traditional, charismatic, and legal rational. So patriarchal and patrimonial authority, and she's talking about patriarchalism as a category here, are forms of traditional, legit traditional legitimacy, um, insofar as obedience is based on the validity of the past, um, whether kind of age-old commandments or bloodlines or elders. Um, so on the contrary, then, the others have to do with charismatic authority, and this legitimacy then springs from the unique personality or gifts or innovations of a particular leader or prophet. Whereas legal rational legitimacy um, arises from the articulation of rationalized norms, principles, and procedures issuing from um, particular, often bureaucratic institutions and offices. So she's using the first of these categories in social theory, traditional authority, and then talking about patriarchalism as a tool of analysis in the work that she's engaged in. So in Marianne Weber's account of the history of gender relations, marriage, properly speaking, emerges when, quote, the absolute power of the man finds finds its limits through certain obligations toward the woman, end of quote. So only here does one move from what she calls primitive patriarchalism to legitimate patriarchalism, and thus to an ordered structure that one can actually call marriage. Um, so for, for Weber, then, legitimate marriage um, it grows up on the floor of patriarchalism and was something that ultimately um, served the interest of women and children and not necessarily men in that shift from primitive to legitimate. It allows women and children, she says, to have claims over against the husband and father. Though thoroughly patriarchal and still oppressive to women and children in all sorts of ways, um, the presence of communal norms and standards, she says, signals the creation of some kind of institution, and at some level, institutions offer at least minimal protection to persons who are subject to them. The existence of the idea of a dowry is the example she gives here. It's an important uh, move. So now the woman is given over to the power of the man, not unconditionally, but through a tool that elevates a certain woman to the status of wife, to a, to a position of a concubine, and thus secures for that particular woman children as legitimate heirs of a man. Um, so Weber um, summarizes the crucial features of this development from primitive to legitimate patriarchalism in the following way. She says, in this way, the oldest conscious structuring of sexual relations was created everywhere out of the natural relation of power. The so-called legitimate marriage is an insurance of certain women and their children against the polygamous drives of the husband. Otherwise, initially, marriage completely maintained the character of a relationship of ownership. End of quote. So this original structure, then, was the basis for all subsequent developments, which tended, notwithstanding the particularities of their cultural and social forms, in the same general directions. On the one hand, she says, civilizations tended over time to strive somehow toward mo mo modes of protection, to somehow protect the woman from what she calls the barbaric arbitrariness of the man, or the husband, while simultaneously equally preserving the husband's domination over her and her children. Um, so this is now what she calls a, a certain kind of humane patriarchy, which strives to temper the husband's domination, but does not grant the wife any kind of recognition. Um, so Weber tends to see the development of marriage um, as a relative historical concept of social order, she says, um, that develops in complicated and nonlinear ways. Um, religion plays an important role in shaping the moral norms for marriage, um, such as, for example, the insolubility of marriage, or the demand for monogamy on the part of either uh, women alone or also on the part of men, or the demand for chastity among unmarried girls. Um, in addition, for Baker, the status of women tends to be elevated in cultures marked by spiritual elements and structured or calculated activity. Yet, she says, quote, the tendency to an enslaving of women is found in many cultures, and the patriarchal family, family dominates in all stages of cultures. The end of quote. So, thus, for, for Weber, marriage has elements that are both confining and emancipatory for women. 
But the quest for a myth of an original, unregulated, matrilineal, or non-monogamous form of sexual relations is not the path, in her view, to women's protection or agency. Weber's construction of um, primitive rel religions, then, I want to suggest here, is predicated on certain interesting ideas. Um, first, that patriarchy is not actually limited to or unique to primitive cultures, or to any period, but present in all. And secondly, that sex outside of institutions and moral norms doesn't actually protect women. So in this, um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about how this relates to a kind of a theory of power and agency that I see being developed in our social theory, but also just in terms of pure historical or cultural resonances, I think we can hear the echoes of her critical dialogue with other feminists of the day, um, especially those in, this, uh, in the um, free love movement that were associated with this new ethic of sexual eroticism. She, she doesn't want to go in that direction for the emancipation of women. She wants to go in the direction of social institutions and what, what they offer um, for the protection of women. So my second top, topic then tonight has to do with mo her analysis of monotheism and marriage. And I want to look specifically at how she defines structure and agency and empowerment within these specific contexts. So she says um, that it's with the development of ancient versus primitive <coughs> cultures that small steps are taken toward the recognition of women. Um, in her account of ancient cultures, or, um, they would give special significance to monotheism in the history of marriage. So in her treatment of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, um, they were tapped into Orientalist research that had been produced in the decades leading up to her study. She reads these traditions, as she does so-called primitive religion, in relation to norms about marriage and sexual regulation in the modern West. The three monotheistic traditions, she says, bring about a turning point in definitions of marriage. On the one hand, she says, they provide sanctioning for patriarchalism, but also, on the other, they, quote, limited it through a measure of theocratic protection of the rule. So Judaism, in particular, in her view, surrounds marriage for the first time with a religious consecration, she says, of nothing less than world historical significance. So while ancient Judaism, she grants, permits polygamy, it lends deep theological significance to the covenant of marriage as an institution and order blessed and mandated by God, who also calls for the subordination of wife to husband, and therefore establishes a holy but patriarchal institution. So looking, and, uh, looking at pre-exilic Judaism, for example, Weber notes parallels between Mosaic and Babylonian law in regards to the position of women, but observes that in certain ways Mosaic law, probably because of this spiritual relation, was more humane than Babylonian law. She says that the idea of being a chosen people leads the Jews to place their moral codes on, quote, a higher level than that of the human people, end quote. Harlotry and idolatry were condemned in ways that improved the status of women. Otherwise, she says, um, pre-exilic notions of gender relations were centered around the authority and privilege of the fathers. And she gives certain examples of definitions of adultery. Um, and this reflected then a general and strict idea of marriage as, of, and pro as property and was therefore, in many senses, a strict form of patriarchalism. But Weber also attributes particular significance in the history of Judaism to the post-exilic period, which brings about what she calls a softening of patriarchalism. And she tracks this as well. And she says then later, over a long period, Judaism, especially as evidenced in the writings of the Talmud, uh, it helps advance the move away from primitive patriarchalism to legitimate marriage. The rabbis begin to recognize the importance of the endowment of the woman as part of her claim to protection and security. In addition, the Talmud, in the Talmud, one begins to see the idea of the man having obligations to the woman. Most important for the legal advance of women was the formulation, again initiated by the rabbis, of the ketubah. And the Talmud also makes it more difficult for a man to divorce a woman, another step that protects the wife. Um, so these developments, she says, quote, led from primitive patriarchalism, which represents a pure relationship of possession, to a contractual securing of certain rights for women. Legitimate marriage, she writes, is also here a protection of women against the absolute despotic rule of the man in distinction from all other gender relations. So similarly, in her treatment of marriage in Islam, they ever contrast the primitive patriarchalism of the early Arabic tribes with the developments that occur at the time of the Prophet. In her account of gender relations um, in various types of cultures and histories, Weber repeatedly e emphasizes, regardless of what culture she's talking about, that militarization tends to involve contempt for women. And this is true, she states also, for the warrior Arabs, she says, quote, and the pre-Islamic and Islamic times. Um, militarization or the, or the pursuit of war um, leads men to strive for countless progeny, 
uh, and always to wish for a son or a future soldier. She writes, but what a hardship for the mother who only gives birth to daughters. Demilitarization, she continues, quote, tends to have an influence on the elevation of the situation of women. So for Weber, uh, both the Quran and the Prophet contribute positively to the ethical regulation of the relation between the genders. The Prophet Muhammad brings about important changes for the status of women, in her view. He, for, he first, she says, forbids the sale of children during pregnancy and helps bring about a revival that begins to regulate the relation of men and women, and therefore mitigates, very modestly, she noted, she notes, the vulnerability of wives and daughters. Muhammad's efforts to limit prostitution and demand chastity ultimately provide protection to women and girls. Quote, the great religious revival led to the standardization and tight regulation of marriage ethics, which in turn, uh, which in many points was also shaped by Mosaic law and the Talmudic models. So she's drawing these connections among various types of monotheism and what they do for marriage. Um, yet in all three monotheistic religions, she says, the father still rules, only not with constraints. So Weber assesses these developments in various and conflicting ways, which are very interesting for recent um, efforts to kind of think about the politics of defining uh, religions outside of Christianity in this period of German history. So on the one hand, um, as I'll discuss below, the consecration of marriage lays the groundwork for an ethical and spiritual form of the institution in which both uh, partners are respected and called to an ethical relationship that's capable of recognizing and affirming the rights of women. In both Judaism and Islam, in Weber's view, the essential legal codes for marriage are based on, quote, religious revelation. This has its advantages, in her view. For, quote, the Quran, varies, the Quran values marriage highly and claims it, as does the Talmud, as a duty of each person, end quote. Yet, as mentioned, the consecration of marriage by God amounts to a sanctioning of patriarchalism at the same time that will exert its negative influence on women and that will leave the institution of marriage unchanged for millennia. So concerning uh, marriage in Islam, uh, Weber therefore claims that, quote, Islamic marriage law is a great contrast to the modern Western form of family life. She closes her ambivalent, sometimes positive, um, portrait of the gender ethic Islam, the gender ethic of Islam, with the very dismissive comment that, quote, the Islamic family has not changed in 1,300 years and marks a great contrast with Western culture and capitalist development. So the divinely commended form of marriage in Judaism also shapes Christian doctrines concerning women, in her view. Concerning the influence of early Christianity on the status of women, Weber refers again to a double-edged sword. Quote, one can with equal justification state simultaneously that early Christianity purified the relations among the genders and heightened the value assigned, assigned to women on the one hand, um, and, and, mostly through Paul, initiated a renaissance of patriarchalism that sanctioned the factual and legal subordination of women up until our time, on the other hand. So in her analysis of Christian history, Weber points to Paul's success in sealing women's obligation of obedience and, and the women's inferior to the man, inferiority to the man. So this doctrine of patriarchalism, she says, remains unchallenged throughout the development of the institution of the church, which also begins early in its history to become preoccupied with ascetic ideals that seek excessively to control sex and, quote, to despise all that is natural until the very relation between men and women is classified as part of the domain of sin. These ideas about women's sexuality and sin serve to strengthen norms for women's subordination. Um, the magisterial reformers, in her view, do nothing to challenge these ideas despite their affirmation of marriage over celibacy. Um, Luther, in Weber's account of the history of theological norms concerning marriage, is a chief defender of patriarchalism and roots it in part in Eve's sin. So, but notwithstanding her critique of pa Christian patriarchalism, um, Weber's analysis of monotheism and marriage is interesting here because it's predicated on a theory of power that's different than we might, uh, might suppose for a liberal Protestant intellectual of this period. So women are protected in her view even as they are subordinated. Um, and agency, Weber seems to suggest, takes place within tradition, um, not, with, not with an individualizing outside of tradition, and thus within dominating structures. I'll return to this a little bit briefly at the end. So my last section then just deals briefly with what I'm calling marriage and modernization, which is kind of trying, I'm trying to trace a parallel track of how she tells the story of what we might call today secularization um, in her own way that kind of tracks and parallels um, other narratives at the time. So 
Um, alongside the patriarchalism of the Christian doctrine of marriage, there develops in Weber's view a, quote, large new cultural product that contains potentially seeds for women's emancipation within the institution, end quote. So this happens, this initially happens in her view in early Christianity and in Stoicism, when she says for the first time in history, um, there is an imposed, uh, that both of these traditions impose a demand of monogamy um, on the man as well as on the woman. This creates a new marriage ideal that generates a religious cultural imperative, she says, that is directed toward and called upon the participation of both partners. So marriage becomes an institution that, quote, nurtures the spiritual strength of men and women, and that creates fertile ground for a, quote, tender and deep spiritual relation between man and woman, end quote. For much of Christian history, beginning with many of Paul's ideas, this impulse does not develop in ways that tend toward women's emancipation, but instead carries on in the mode of patriarchalism. But the theological ideas that develop in Calvinism, however, do nurture moral and spiritual sensibilities that later tend in the direction of, quote, a moral equality of the sexes and indirectly toward the higher positioning and valuing of women, end quote. So the ethical consequences, she says, of belief in divine predestination lead to a stronger emphasis on moral discipline and self-control, which can promote a marriage setting in which women and men focus on a relationship that differs from standard forms of patriarchalism. Um, this ideal, then, is deepened most significantly in Puritan and other Protestant movements that lay outside of the major institutional churches. So Puritanism, she says, deepens this marriage ideal in a counterintuitive way and by means of an unexpected path. Um, precisely through its strict asceticism, um, or its negative attitude toward pleasures and sensuality, she says, it gives marriage a very clear purpose, the procreation of children for the greater glory of God, and otherwise encourages spouses to develop their spiritual relationship above all else. So marriage is no longer defined according to, to sexuality, and women are no longer defined according to men according to sex. So, although she, so she has a, a great quote here um, that sums up her, her kind of vision of a possible origin of a marriage ideal that could be emancipatory for women. She says, although Puritanism tends toward prudery, that is an acceptable price to pay for the respect of the woman. So here we say, we see in Weber's view, the cultivation of two free and moral personalities within the marriage bond, and therefore also the recognition of the moral personality of the woman. Weber sees the confirmation of this potentially emancipatory ideal in the fact that it is the Puritan and other similar Protestant movements in the United States that take the first steps um, that first take the religious equality of the woman seriously. And she says the Quakers, above all, emphasize the idea of freedom of conscience, um, the mother of all civil rights of the individual, and also the cradle of women's rights, she says. So these early modern Protestant groups represent an impulse toward the development of marriage ideals that Weber seems to approve of in her own essays on marriage and morals at the time. So modern marriage, in her view, should be, quote, a life's partnership that is founded on the affinity of souls and senses, and on the desire for full responsibility is the highest ideal of human community that stands as an unshakable guiding star above the sexual life of civilized humanity. So this marriage ideal shares with Puritanism the focus on spirituality above mere sex drive and the desire to shape the personality of both partners. But of course it demands a host of economic, legal, educational, and political rights for women that are appropriate in Weber's view for a modern industrialized capitalist society. So, Mariana Weber's vision for marriage and modernity again yields a model of religion that we might not expect from such a thinker. And so far as it doesn't look a lot like the portrait, maybe the caricature, of the modern conception of religion that we as scholars have come today to associate with the liberal Protestant theorists who, who helped craft that infamous generic category of religion. So here, a liberal theological interest in free personality is combined with a plea for the value of and need for virtues of submission and obedience. And these together create the free and moral subject. So um, I'm going to conclude now um, just by offering that um, I hope that by looking at these three features of Mariana Weber's theory of religion, that I've begun to problematize um, implicitly the assumptions that scholars have made about the origins and definition and content of the category of religion as we've come to critique it and use it in. Um, certain interventions about what it must mean today. 
So, and also as it was debated and defined during this important moment in the modern study of religion. So indeed, Weber, uh, Mariana Weber, did not associate religion, for example, primarily with belief. Um, the distinction she was making among these groups had nothing to do with beliefs or so-called superstitions or superstitions behind rituals. They're really about um, social relations and um, uh, notions of family and sexuality and communal practice. So she doesn't associate religion primarily with belief. Um, she doesn't see it as unrelated to the public sphere, so it's not private. And she did not think that traditional authority had to be escaped for the, autonomous, for the sake of the autonomous subject. So I also hope that I've begun to show that scholarly analyses of modernization and secularization in Germany around the turn of the century were far from gender neutral. Gender, indeed, might be one missing link in scholarly understandings of the origin and rhetorical function of theories about religion and modernity today. Thank you.